Okay. Good evening. I'm going to call the Board of Selectmen to order. It's Thursday, March 7th, and we're going to be um, chatting with Michael Todd, moderator, and Will Kidder, town clerk, about um, election next Monday and Tuesday. Oh, you mean there's or Tuesday a, and Wednesday. There is me. an election. Is there an election coming up, Janet? Yeah, got it. Okay. Tuesday. Don't need the humor. <laughs> town election. Oh, yeah. And, and by the way, sorry, let me add one more thing. BB Casey is here remotely. Okay, you want to? Uh, I move that we allow BB to participate. Press your button. I move that we allow BB to participate remotely. I can see her, <laughs> I can hear her, and I believe she can see us and hear us. Okay, and I'll second that. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Okay. All right, Michael. Sorry. All right, that's all right, Janet. We're good. All right. So, um, true. We have the official ballot voting day on Tuesday next week uh, for town meeting. And we have in, in this town a bifurcated town meeting, which means we are allowed to conduct voting all day on Tuesday from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. at Whipple Hall. <clears throat> and then we reconvene the meeting at, at uh, 7 p.m. the next day on Wednesday at this location, Cougar Court, uh, to conduct the rest of the business meeting of the town, which is the other warrant articles, which do not relate to election of officers or the zoning amendments. All the other articles will be dealt with on Wednesday night, beginning at 7 p.m. We have our uh, volunteers in place. We conducted a training session um, last night at Whipple Hall uh, with a couple of PowerPoints to, to bring some of our new volunteers up to speed because the procedures associated with running an election and the procedures associated with conduct a town meeting by our inspectors of election are different. And, so we um, created two training sessions to address those issues so that all the people, all of our volunteers are up to speed. And Casey Busso and uh, Rose Bernard have put together a schedule um, for both events. A lot of the volunteers for the election would simply be carrying over to the town meeting. And that's great because we need to have enough volunteers in place to um, make the efficient conduct of um, secret ballots, if there are any to be called, um, and we will conduct those with the use of certain shoe boxes, which was uh, pioneered by one of our uh, sister towns to make the um, execution of a secret paper ballot much more efficient without all the voters having to leave their chairs. And so I had a special session on that as to how to conduct that um, uh, shoe box ballot is essentially what we call it. <clears throat> so all of our people should be up to speed on that. We need teams to, to keep track of the ballot boxes and not lose them. So I think we're in pretty good shape as volunteer wise. Um, I don't. I will. Do you have anything more you want to add? To yeah. That? No, I, I would agree. I feel like we're in pretty pretty good shape overall. Um, you know, there's still really the only stuff that's remaining on my end is doing some of the ballot machine tests this weekend and doing the poll pad tests. And our final new poll pad is coming Monday at about three o'clock in the afternoon, so it should slide right in just in time. Yep. Um, as so as you may yeah. uh, recall, at the primary. Um, in order to process the absentee ballots, we had to borrow a poll pad device and use it on the stage to process those absentee ballots so that everything is on real time. And, and, and in order to do that, we had to take the poll pad from the check-in table. And we weren't very smart. We took it away from the check-in table at 10 o'clock, which is the peak the peak of the voter turnout for the morning. And so we suddenly had to stop and move it back down there. But now that we know the, and this is a cool thing about the poll pads, it's all real time. So they can give a graph as to when your peak periods of voter turnout are. So now we can uh, coordinate how we want to process absentee ballots so that we, if we have to borrow another machine, we can, but he has already alleviated it by ordering another one. So we should be fine. We should be able to process um, the volume of voters that turn up and will be should be well placed for the primary and then the general election in November. And all of this, we're doing all of this to train our people for the big test, which we believe is going to be in November. That's when we're really going to get slammed with voter turnout. Mm -hmm. So uh, all of the training that we're doing now is just building, building, building to make sure we're ready for November and the uh, New Hampshire primary in September. Yeah, so I think we're I think we're in pretty good shape. Yeah. I'm really happy about that. And anybody else out there watching or here or whatever that wants to volunteer for the election team, we'd love to have you. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of new volunteers turning out, and that's ramping up our training. Uh, we're in the process of rewriting the ballot clerk manual so that it'll be current and up to date because the procedures are always changing, particularly with the poll pads. Um, the only other challenging thing is the fact that the Secretary of State has granted us 
leave to use these poll pads, um, provided we run a parallel system with the paper books. So the challenge has been finding a location for those people working the paper books because it's kind of an intense operation. They have to take the little tickets from the poll pad and record that historical information into the checklist books the way it would have been done had we not had the poll pad. And being a social event like the election is, it's the people need to be put in a place where they won't be interrupted constantly by people coming by and saying, hi, how you doing and all that. And before we had them up on the front of the stage where everyone could see them because mm -hmm. we wanted to the people to be sure that they could see what we were doing. But what happened was whoever was volunteering on the poll books got interrupted so many times that it was hard for them to refocus and get back into what. Yeah. So we're trying to find a location now that we can have them process those tickets, be close enough that we can keep their eye on them, be in a place that the public can see what they're doing, and yet be in a place where they're not disturbed. Mm -hmm. And this is really going to be a challenge because yeah. with the town election, the density is only one poll, one voting booth for every uh, 200 voters. So we only need 15 voting booths. So there's plenty of room in the town hall. Well, for the general election, it's going to be twice that. You're going to need 30 voting booths. So it's all, all that real estate is going to be used up. Yeah. So we have to find a place, kind of an out of the way place where they won't be interfered with and yet there's help available if they need, you know, and, and yet the people can still see, it has to be in full view of the public. So that is our challenge with the real estate in Whipple. It's a great location. I love it now that it's been restored. It's a beautiful space. And we're so lucky to be able to use it for this because everyone comes to vote, gets a chance to see it. Mm -hmm. It's really a cool place. So mm -hmm. that's our challenge is just trying to find some place we can put a six foot table that these two people can work and all the volunteers. I think it's like six or eight during the day, because it, it, it's all day long, and we keep swapping people out, um, that they can work and get that job done. And because that's our backup plan, in case something happens to the poll pads, the Secretary of State's office wants to have, has to have this historical record. And so we're trying to work out, work that, I'm sure we can figure that out, but that's the only challenge that I can think of at the moment. Okay. Um, you want to talk a little bit about Wednesday night, what, how you're going to run that yeah. meeting? This has been an interesting uh, year, I must say, Janet. Thank you for asking that. Um, I've had a lot of calls in my office uh, for the last over the last three weeks about procedural issues relating to the town meeting, and I've tried as best I can to to give the callers the best advice I could give them. Um, what. I, we kind of know, and, and then Kim and I have been over all the articles in the warrant, discussed them and looked at what the options might be and how we would address all those options so that we're in pretty good shape in terms of being ready for whatever the public wants to do with these articles. Mm -hmm. um, some have talked about amendments, and we know that there are probably a couple of them will be amended. What I would encourage the voters to do, if it's at all possible, is to get us at the table, the head table in writing before the election, the text of their amendments. And also if any voters wish to be heard on any article, please try to get us your names in advance so that we can make sure that when the discussion comes, when that article is put on the floor for discussion, that if you've put your name in, that you get a chance to speak. And in order to facilitate this in addition to that um we're going to conduct the discussion in a slightly different manner uh, this year which i think will be a little bit better in addition to the roving microphones we're going to have a center mic in the in the center of the hall in the center aisle which we've had all these prior years and i'm just going to encourage people that want to be heard on the article when the article is called to the floor come and stand near the microphone come and queue up at the microphone and then we will take the speakers in order in the order the names have been given to me or in the order that they queue up in the line. And if the question is move, if if someone moves the question, which is essentially a motion to, to cut off the debate, then I think my policy is going to be that debate will not be cut off. I will not allow that motion to be voted on until everyone in the queue has had a chance to speak once. Because it's clear to all the voters that the people in the queue would like to be heard. 
And in order to facilitate robust debate, in the words of, of Alf Jacobson, one of our former moderators for years and years, that the whole purpose of democracy and one of the fundamental principles of democracy is to have robust debate on any issue. In order to encourage that to happen, we should not allow the question to be moved until those people that have queued up in line and made their presence known that they wish to be heard can have an opportunity to do that, to do so. Now, as a caveat to that, I would also say that if all the five or six people in line are, are speaking in favor of the article, rather than reiterating what the first speaker had said, it would be sufficient for the minds of the voters, I believe, to say, I believe in Mr. X, I support what Mr. X has said, and then retire. That will make an economical use of the available time that we have for debate. There's also been some suggestions advanced about limiting the debate to a certain number of minutes. And in the past, we have not been able to do that, but it's the people's meeting. If the people want to adopt uh, a rule for the for the course of this meeting alone that says, yes, we would like limit to be debate to be limited to three minutes. And they've so voted, that's fine. I'm happy to offer the motion or have someone else offer the motion and second it to limit debate. Other than that, I think a reasonable cutoff would be a warning at four minutes and cut off at five. But if that's the plan, the voters have to understand that at the beginning. We can't impose rules as we go along. So um, I'm not really set in stone on that. We'll kind of see how that goes, but we do want to make sure that the meeting doesn't get over at 3 a.m. And on the other side, we want to make sure that those wishing to be heard have an opportunity to be heard for a reasonable period of time. And I guess that's all I can think of. That... Um, with regard to petition warrant articles, do you want the petitioner to present the article yeah the the general modus operandi is that is that we would recognize the 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 proponent of that article mm -hmm. the, the petitioner to and they would be initially the ones to speak on that article they affected its inclusion in the warrant they solicited the signatures they should have an opportunity to explain to the voters why they did that and why they would like the voters to vote for or against that article probably for i would guess okay Bill, do you have any questions? No. no? I, I do for, for three of us in a minute. But... Okay. BB, do you have any questions for Michael? No? Okay. It's a delicate balance, and I try to do my very best to, to make sure that the, mm -hmm. the debate is sufficient and fair and that the voters have a reasonable understanding about what they're to vote on. That's my job. But it's your meeting. It's a meeting conducted on the behalf of the selectmen to conduct the business of the town. And the business of the town is limited to the warrant articles that have been published to the public mm -hmm. in advance of the meeting. And hopefully we can make it make our way through that list of warrant articles in an efficient and effective manner on uh, town meeting night. Um, Michael, have you spoken with uh, the school about having the kids sing again? Are they gonna yeah. be there? Um, I got an email from uh, Nicole, she asked me if we would like to have them, mm -hmm. and I told her that we would. Yeah. So they will be there to lead us with the uh, national anthem okay. and the Pledge of Allegiance, All right. and off we go after that. Okay. All right. Any other questions? My only question, uh, go ahead. Janet, with you and BB is splitting up the, the our time there at the on the voting day mm -hmm. our, our time oh yeah and i wanted to ask michael yeah. because janet is on the ballot is there any restriction on her ability to be take four of the hours please um that's okay so janet uh, this is an interesting i'm glad you brought that up uh, bill because um there are certain rules uh, imposed upon us um with respect to those election officials and maybe volunteers, we have both this year, who are on the ballot for various reasons. And the restriction is that obviously those persons whose names are on the ballot to be voted on at elect on election day, obviously cannot participate in any electioneering activities in the polling place. And furthermore, those persons are ineligible to handle ballots on election day. So I've had to appoint two deputies uh, assistant moderators to do the ballot handling that I would ordinarily do on election day because I can't be caught handling a ballot because I'm on the ballot. Um, I, I think that's essentially what the, the gist of your question well, I just is. wanted to be sure that uh, 
because we usually split up four hours for each of us. Understood. Okay. And I wanted to make so, sure Janet could do her four hours. Right. Um, yes, she can. She can. We will find things for her to do, but she will not be able to handle ballots. I, I was sure that yeah. was him. Yeah. So and just... then on town meeting day, of course, that's fine. She has all of her normal uh, responsibilities on that day because the election has been concluded and the results are tallied at that point. Yeah. yeah. So what time would each of you like to have? I'm totally free that day. BB, what would you like? I, I would like the three to seven shift again, if possible. I have a class again that I have to run. Okay. All right. I'll do seven to 11 again. Is okay. That... I'll do the middle. Okay. Okay. I'll do and thank to you. Three. I haven't seen it yet. I don't think Kim and I have gone over it yet, but the warrant, it's customary for the selectmen to address articles in the warrant that were inserted by them, not the petition warrant articles. Um, but at some point before town meeting, if you could tell me who is going to be speaking to which article, I'd be happy to introduce you once that article is moved on the floor okay. and we can proceed to discussion. Good. And that's the only other thing I think I need um, before Wednesday night and I'm ready to roll. Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, Michael. You're welcome, Janet. Everybody. Thank, thank, thank you. you so. What did John has a question? Oh, okay. Did you? Oh. Okay. Did you have questions for either Michael or Will? No? John, who's your... Hang on. John, you're going to have to come up here. Oh, no, never mind. Sorry. No, Michael, uh, uh, you had mentioned the uh, time limit. Are you leaving that open at the beginning or you're going to propose the five minute? Okay. As a fundamental principle of the town meeting in general... The meeting belongs to the voters and the rules that I've published in the town warrant are advisory, but the moderator can be overruled by on any of his decisions by a by a majority of the voters. So that having been said, I don't believe I have specified, read, read, reread my rules. I don't think I've specified a time limit in my rules. So at that meeting, depending on the, the the prevailing wind between now and then, I may propose it to the body and say, there's been some discussion about not wanting to be here until 3 a.m. I would entertain a motion to limit debate to three minutes, four minutes, whatever. Do I have a second? And then we would have a discussion and the meeting populace would vote on that. And if they adopt it, then they are bound and all the speakers are bound by whatever the people want because it is your meeting. I'm just here to help facilitate it and help run it. Right. I think, just as a personal note, I think if you can't get your point across in three to four minutes, you need to reword your presentation. So I think, I think I'm think i leaning on a, a three to four and blowing a whistle at five. I think that's kind of where I'm leaning, but I will put it to the meeting and let you decide how you want to do it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So anybody in the audience could could say, let's make it five minutes, even though you say three, for example. Yeah. And we would put it to a vote. And if the entire populace said five minutes, five minutes, it is. Right. It's the people's meeting. Right. A second ago, you said if if it was three to four minutes, you would let it go to five minutes. I'm trying to be a reasonable guy. I would say, hey, wrap it up. You I blow the whistle. You got a minute. John, you got a minute. John, we're at five minutes. I have to cut you off. Okay. Trying uh, to be polite, trying to be civil, trying to just keep the debate moving. And you just you know, get those, you know, fine tune those points and get them in, get in and get out. Because people go, you know, they start, they start daydreaming. I know I do. So, yeah. Uh, and as far as standing, uh, if anyone wanted to, uh, I'm thinking of a candidate, if they wanted to uh, promote their candidacy, are they allowed to stand outside Whipple Hall on the sidewalk? On election day, the electioneering area is defined by previous um, regulations that have been issued by me, and it is confined to the monument area in front of Whipple Hall on Tuesday, election day. So if any candidates wish to run for public office, um, or write in as a case, and that's how I got elected, is out there with a write-in sign, um, they are limited to the area of the monument. They cannot encroach on the sidewalk. They cannot call out to potential voters, but if voters speak to them, they may greet them and so on and so forth. They can't be 
impeding the voters' progress up the sidewalk and into the polling place. So yes, the electioneering area will be open. Uh, uh, persons running for a public office are encouraged to remain in that area, and each may hold a single sign. There can be no freestanding signs in the electioneering area. One person may hold one sign. And okay. if there's two people and one has to go get a cup of coffee, I have to lay the sign down and the other person can hold the sign. Well, one person per sign. Bingo. Okay. Thank you. It was sufficient for me. It should be sufficient for those. Yes. Uh, so can somebody who's holding the sign also hand out a slip of paper kind of describing why they should be voted for? They can't thrust the paper into the face of the voter as they're walking down the sidewalk. Right. They cannot in any way impede the voter on their way to conduct the voter's business in the polls. But if they're standing there holding a, fl a flyer and someone says, oh, can I have a flyer? Yes, you can give them a flyer. Makes sense. It's got to be, we have to have zero intimidation or perceived intimidation of the voters coming and going from the polling place. That is the law. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, just since this is being recorded, John Ellis was the first speaker and Rich Epstein was the second, in case anybody was wondering who the speakers Thank were. Thank you, Janice. Are there any other questions for Michael while he's here, Peter? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Peter Nichols. Quick question. How many registered voters are there expected? Oh, uh, you're killing me. Um, there's 36. 3,631. 3, I just did the thing today, <laughs> that, that number. 3,631 registered voters in the town of London. Um, oh, what do we get for turnout, Will? It's it's what, 25, 30% at the election, if that? It's like 587 last year, I think, but yeah. it's been up to 1200. For I'm sorry, elections. I didn't. If I have my laptop, I have all the prior years in there. But, but town town meeting attendance doubled last year from roughly 250 to approximately 400. Uh, we're anticipating this would be a robust turnout, and we have extra chairs. I don't know if we've made provisions to for overflow for an overflow room. If we have to have an overflow room, I'm just mentioning, I think if we have to have an overflow room, there's got to be a video link and there's got to be an assistant moderator and they have to, we have to be able to talk back and forth so that people from the overflow room can have the floor once properly recognized. I mean, it's it's kind of an extra layer of AV support. And I don't know if we've even contemplated that. Well, you know- What is, I don't know the capacity of that hall. I should well, know, but- Since we replaced the ble bleachers, I think that there's plenty of capacity. They've never okay. been filled. Yeah. I, I can't imagine that they would be. I think if, if a thousand people showed up, let's say, I think we would have to recess the meeting to another date Understood. and then do the steps you just said, because for sure it, it won't hold a thousand. Well, I think I, we can all agree it wouldn't hold a thousand. Right? I remember the Kearsarge Regional School District organizational meetings and meetings after the school was built. Mm -hmm. And the main meeting was in the auditorium and the auxiliary was Overflow that? was in the gymnasium. Correct. And we had to have AV link to make the meeting legal. So I'm just thinking, I know there's going to be another threshold if we can't fit everyone in the gymnasium. Okay. So we'll have to see how it turns out, but and you know, we're happy to accommodate. We love the fact that people come to vote. Uh, we just have to ha make sure we have the accommodations available to make it okay. available for everyone to be heard and everyone to, to understand what's going on. Will, will you might have the fire chief uh, provide information in advance as to what the capacity I, I believe that number is 850 room. in that room. And the ballot clerks have been instructed to keep a running total so that as people trickle in, we will know what the uh, total number of registered voters oh, is. We won't know what the non or the non-resident attendees are. We won't know what the resident unregistered voter attendees are, but we will know who checks in. We need to know that because we have to match it to the secret ballot count. Correct. Or the hand card count if we ask them to be held up and counted aloft. Okay. So we need that as a check total. And um, th that's kind of gets some idea what the capacity of the hall is, but it doesn't include those folks that are not registered voters, unfortunately. Okay. We'll need turnstiles for that. Um, Nancy, did you have a question? Thank you. Um, I asked this last night of these two. On the night of town meeting, the lines are long and slow. 
and I asked why we couldn't use the machines you use to check people in at election to do the check-in. And they defended the cost that that would be. I would ask all of us to pay attention to how slow the lines are. I only know standing in line, it was long. It's the longest line I've been in for a long time. Um, just pay attention to that and think about whether there is an efficiency value to use the check-in machines to get people in on town meeting. Okay. Um, that was Nancy Moraccio. If I may. Can I, can I just throw something in there too? I actually called LHS today about that and I'm waiting for a call back on them, but we may not be able to do that because we can't use a checklist for a town meeting. We have to use an A to Z list. So I don't know if that's going to cause problems or not, but it might. <laughs> um, so waiting for an answer. Yep. No, I, I, thank you, Will. I appreciate that. We're, we're making inquiries to, to try to see how that can be alleviated. What I can say is that there will be election workers in the lobby. First of all, in the past, people have wanted to avail themselves of the crowd that comes to town meeting. And so persons that are, are trying to move forward certain causes, whether they be conservation related or trail related or whatever, have asked us to have tables in the lobby so that, that they can have an opportunity to explain their program to the voters. And I'm all in favor of that. What we need to make sure though, is that those tables are out of the main flow of traffic that's going to come in those two doors and it's gonna go in one door or the other. And those doors will have uh, alphabets on them so that A through K goes in these doors and L through Z goes in these doors because the check-in books have been split up two on one end and two on the other end to accommodate the maximum number of voters in the minimum amount of time because everyone arrives at once and we go to the meeting. It's not like trickle in during the voting session. It's a, it's a massive group of people that all get here by the time the meeting starts and they all have to be checked in at once. Four books is what we've contemplated we could go to six, but you're still stuck with that traffic flow getting through the doors. We could change the loc the change the arrangement of the check-in to make the tables longer and have three stations on each side. That's a possibility. I think we have the uh, we have the bodies for that. We can split the checkup books any way we need to. Uh, but your point is very well taken. We need to process a vol large volume of people in a short amount of time so that everyone can get into place so, so that the meeting can start on time. Um, if we did that, uh, poll pads might be the answer, but Will's waiting on that. And you know, as we progress, we will work this thing along and we'll come up with an answer. But I thank you for pointing that out. I didn't realize there was that much of a delay before. So thank you for doing that and keeping our eye on us. Nancy has one more question. Um, part of the slowness is a checklist is a pain in the neck to find a name. You have to go through pages. Oh, I get it. The machine, as soon as you hit the name, gives you the name. Well, as soon as you put the ID and it finds the name for you, I get that. And dividing it into more books and, and div diluting it down and having more people looking for more names simultaneously should shorten the line. I get that. But we may have reached the limits of what we're doing as the attendance of town meeting increases. So that's a very well, that's point is very well taken. I thank you for bringing it up. And we're, as, as Will can say, you know, we're working on it. We're trying to sort this out. Um, Kim, you had mentioned that if- John uh, Ellis is speaking now. Uh, sorry. Uh, you had mentioned if we reach 851, that would have to be postponed to another day. What does that mean? I suggested it would be 1,000. Will said it, the room capacity is about 850. So what I suggested is that if, if 1,000 people showed up and we could not put them in the room, all at the same time, the meeting would have to be recessed to another date and everybody would have to come back. And during that time, we would set up what Michael talked about, which would be another room with AV or whatever else to accommodate that number of voters. Because we wouldn't be able to hold the meeting if everybody couldn't be in the room. Understood. So the, the 850 is a material, it's a thousand people and make it That's stand I, I just the guess. outside. I was just using that number, John, as a to illustrate my point that if, a, if too many people showed up right. at the meeting and we could they couldn't all be in the room, we would have to recess the meeting 
to a time when we could accommodate all the people. So you're including standing room only, is that what you mean? Well, I'm including whatever well, the fire you're, thinks you're limited be. by the number of square feet per person as determined by the fire department. Isn't it 850? I don't know. I can't remember. I had it written down. 850 is what Jay told me, but that wasn't his official thing. He was going to go back and look, but that was what he roughly thought. So what we're thinking, John, when you thought, stop and think about this logistically, is we booked the use of this gymnasium for town meeting on, this, on the Wednesday following the second Tuesday in March. Okay. So what you're, if what you're proposing becomes a reality, then we have to then we have to double book. We have to book another venue for seven days later with two areas, just in case we might need it. Now, maybe we have to sign a contract. Maybe we have to put down a down payment. Maybe there's a cancellation clause because we'll know on town meeting whether or not we need that seven days later. But it's it adds another whole layer, as we said, another whole layer of AV support and another whole layer of, of, of booking to to affect the the town meeting but as we increase and more people get involved and want to come to town meeting we're, we're going to have to address it but in order for that to be fruition for this town meeting we'd have to have double the attendance we had at last town meeting and then we'd be close to the capacity right uh who know i don't know i don't i don't have a crystal ball i can't tell but it it, it could be some delay if that massive turnout were to occur i in some ways i think it'd be great but in other ways it presents logistical issues it's certainly voter participation which is a good thing but it, it presents logistical challenges i hope we can accommodate them okay if there are no further questions for michael we'll thank you and good night may I be yes you may all right um do i have does anyone want to make a public comment about anything that's not on our agenda john Um, I'm here tonight to ask the, John Wilson. Is oh, I'm, yes, this is John Wilson. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm here tonight to ask the voters of New London to vote no on zoning amendment number four. Uh, my life seems to be coming up fours lately. Uh, this time it's zoning amendment four, which you will be voting on Tuesday, voting day, the day prior to town meeting. Uh, let me be clear, this is not Article 4, which you'll be voting on at town meeting on Wednesday. On Tuesday, March 12th, New London voters will receive a ballot which seeks their approval of six zoning amendments. Each proposed amendment is accompanied by an encapsulated description, which often comes up short in explaining what the voter is in fact voting for. For, pro for proposed amendment four, which deals with accessory dwelling units, the description actually states, the proposed amendment seeks to modify accessory dwelling unit ordinance with changes that include, but are not limited to, dot, dot, dot. There is more regarding this amendment than the, than the, that the voter must know before deciding how to vote. Presently, an accessory dwelling unit, an ADU, is defined as a residential living unit within or attached to a single family dwelling, and that provides independent living facilities for one or more persons, including provisions for sleeping, eating, cooking, and sanitation on the same parcel of land as the principal dwelling unit it accompanies. Attached ADUs with a maximum of two bedrooms and a thousand square feet are presently permitted in all zones. The planning board is proposing that detached accessory dwelling units of three bedrooms and 1,250 square feet be permitted in all zones. These are essentially a second home on a property. This change is properly explained in the description that it accompanies the proposed amendment. Two very important items, however, are left out and should be corrected before the amendment, before amendment four is passed. The first item is the prohibition of manufactured housing, mobile, home, mobile homes. 
uh, being considered detached ADUs. This prohibition is permitted by state law and should have been included in the amendment, but was overlooked. The second item was the belated change to the amendment that permitted detached accessory dwelling units in the Shoreland Overlay District. As late as November 1st, 2023, the new London Housing Commission had agreed to keep the Shoreline District prohibition for detached ADUs in place and not allow detached ADUs in the Shoreline District. Somewhere between November 1st and the public hearing on January 9th, the Planning Board chose to disregard this recommendation from the Housing Commission and to allow detached accessory dwelling units in the Shoreland Overlay District. Why should this matter? Because lake water quality in, is highly dependent on the level of nutrients flowing into the lake, particularly forms of phosphorus. Phosphorus fuels damaging and expensive outbreaks of invasive, invasive weeds. But more importantly, recently, it is leading to outbreaks of cyanobacteria blooms, which produce dangerous cytotoxins, the presence of which can prevent the use of the lakes, particularly the beaches. Some lakes have experienced closures of 100 days or more in New Hampshire. Stormwater runoff and septic systems are the key sources of phosphorus inputs to lakes. Additions of detached accessory dwelling units, even though they may comply with regulations for impervious surfaces and septic loading, have the potential to bring additional phosphorus loading to our lakes and must be avoided. Amendment four must be voted down until the prohibition of manufactured homes is added and until detached accessory dwelling units in the Shoreland Overlay District are prohibited. Vote no on zoning amendment four. Thank you. Thanks, John. Does anyone else have any comments that are different from John's? <laughs> I'm Rich Epstein, resident, and there might be some overlap with what John said. Let, but let's I'm be following brief. up. All right, Rich, we, we have following up, things to do tonight, okay? Yep, I'm following Please. up from something I brought up in a previous meeting, the fact that um, the ballot question for Amendment 4 doesn't even make it so that the reader can tell what is the main change being done in the amendment. And when you know, I read it last time, I uh, I could read it again if you want, no, but it was clear necessary. that it doesn't do. It. And the answer I heard back was, you know, I asked, well, how could this happen? The answer was, we don't know. So I do, I forget if I knew it at the time or maybe I didn't express it. I do also learn that it's not a transparent process on how the ballot question is written. Yes, it's transparent when the planning board meets, but one of the most important output is the ballot question. But the producing of the ballot question is not transparent. So I guess I look at it as, I mean, I, I, I guess I'm trying to, I come from a background where when you see a problem, you at least try to fix it. In we're in a high tech industry, we have a process where you, you, <clears throat> I want to reinforce this. You never blame a person. It's always what can you do to improve the process to make sure these problems don't repeat. So I guess I'm trying, maybe I'm begging that people look at the process, look at why it isn't transparent. Making it transparent might actually make it produce a better result too. Well, I think, I think the planning board is well aware of your thoughts on this. And I imagine that when they, if they have any zoning amendments for next year, that they will um, vet it very thoroughly and make sure that they think it's clear and probably ask your input on it. So, so that um, when people vote, they'll know. But when I asked, the, I already asked the planning board and they said, it's not, they don't do it. So it's not, the planning board doesn't produce the ballot. So that's what I, I, mean, I actually. Well, they produce what is said on the ballot. They submit. No, no, they don't produce the words that are on the ballot. Yes, yeah, yes, they do. 
<laughs> yeah. We're, no, yeah. they don't. No, so staff generally does that. I don't. Right. I don't think the planning board would be opposed if you ask them to to talk about the ballot. I don't think that they are opposed. It's just traditionally been in all towns that I've ever seen and here in New London, staff, according to the law, makes a summary of it. Some towns just say, are you in favor of one or two? We try to put some information so people at least have an idea of what they're talking about. So it's staff, but I don't think the planning board would say, no, we're not going to look at it. Okay, so I, I, I don't think me, that confirm me. I got and, and it could be before twelve correct. years. And I was here. Maybe the planning board did. I, I'm not aware of a town planning board that does it that way, but it could be. Okay, actually, I'm there's curious. no law that says the planning board can't get involved with it. It's just a, um, it's generally delegated to staff because it's just a summary. It's not any the the ballot question isn't um, what goes into the zoning ordinance, right? That's what's created by the planning board. Okay, so it just. Hopefully, people heard Kim confirmed my statement that the right. planning board doesn't okay. produce that yep. the ballot. Thank uh, you. I'm curious. It's not it... going to change anything for this year. Oh, of course, of course. Uh, and <laughs> um, um, I, I was just curious: is it possible for when a ballot question is written that you can actually get uh, into uh, you know proponents and opposing comments to go along with the ballot so people actually can see both sides? Is that an option? No, um, no. The planning board, whatever, whoever proposes the article, it's their proposal. It's not. It's not a back and forth. If you don't like what they're proposing, then you just vote no. I mean, that's that's simple enough. Okay, but I'm trying to get it so that the public knows both sides. I've I know I, in Massachusetts I've seen ballot questions where you actually could get the all of our meetings are are there recorded they're open to the public i mean you know i think um, people have to if they're interested in a particular issue they need to either come to the meeting or watch watch it online so okay. i think we're as open and transparent as possible now the fact that you're not in agreement with how it's been done you know i think the planning board is aware of your thoughts and i'm not sure anything will be changed but they are aware so thank you okay <laughs> Thank you very much. Michael. For the purposes of these articles, the Warren articles that he's talking about, correct me if I'm wrong, but I read the full amendments to these zoning articles in the warrant. All the interlineated and red line material was all in the town report. Correct. And I suspect that the town report in its entirety is available on the town website. So interested voters could go onto the website, look at the town report, and see the exact language and the exact words that are proposing to be deleted and other words that are proposing to be added that constitute the nuts and bolts of these amendments. That's right, Michael. And, and that, I don't know whether I you've looked at your town report, Rich, but it is it is delineated in there. It doesn't. Yeah, you really need to go look at that, and I'm yeah. glad it's available because it's, it's yeah. so rich Epstein again. And so, but of course, I was talking about the ballot question, and we all know that it's a large population, and possibly the majority of the people, all they see is the ballot question. So that's why it's. It is, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with what was said, but that's what the reality is. And it's, I don't know why it, and then I know there's no length restriction to what can be put on, on, on the ballot. So I, I beg that people actually look and see that we do a process improvement so there's better information on the ballot. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just to put in there, the ballots being longer is a financial thing as well, um, because they get longer, they get harder for the machine to deal with and all that sort of stuff. So at a certain point, it becomes ugly, like an eight and a half by 11 is really good. 11 by 17, not so good. <laughs> yeah, no, but if you were to do it to every article, then you'd be, have something. Okay, thanks. Well, all right, Michael. One other point, democracy, freedom, Freedom asks more than it gives. And the founders of the writers of the Constitution stated that 
the success to a democracy is an educated electorate. And so we have to do everything we possibly can to make sure that the voters are well informed on these issues. And so if we publish the entire nuts and bolts of the amendment of the proposed article in the warrant on the website so people can see it, we've made it available to them. We put it in the town warrant, it's in, 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 in a town report in its entirety. Their copies are free. I wonder what else we can do. Thank you, Michael. All right. Are there any other comments? Oh, Peter. Yes, uh, Peter Nichols. Uh, three quick comments to make. Um, listening to my brother, Dr. Wilson, uh, I think it's important with respect to Article 4 and the accessory dwelling unit uh, amendments that are being proposed. Just three quick points. One is related to the size. The Housing Commission recommended an increase in size from 1,000 square feet to 1,250 square feet, uh, which could allow up to three bedrooms, primarily focused on young families, which now uh, often require a separate room for an office because they work remotely. And so the, that was a serious consideration for increasing that size. Uh, secondly, the point on manufactured housing Manufactured housing is actually uh, a term that that includes what used to be called mobile homes, and there can be a, a large uh, reaction of fear to mobile homes and where they're put on properties. There is currently a prohibition that would stand and not be amended that would prohibit, continue to prohibit manufactured housing in the commercial zone, the R1 zone, and in the institutional zone, so that the concern, if there is one, should be focused on what's the reality of manufactured homes being placed in the R2 or the ARR district, which is two acre zoning and four acre zoning, if I understand it correctly. Um, lastly is the Shoreland overlay uh, concern with respect to the pollution, potential additional pollution and contribution of septic uh, overrun of nitrogen and phosphorus uh, coming from septic systems in that in the region around the lakes and rivers. Um, it's highly possible that older homes in those areas are not would actually have an improved condition of septic overrun into the lakes because currently there's no law or ordinance that requires that they be tested. So you could have a home of 30 or 40 or 50 years that had the original septic tank or system in it and never have to test it. It could be failing as it is and contributing to cyanobacteria or what, what might be a, a feared condition. And we, we love our lakes. We want to protect them. If you are proposing an ADU, whether it's detached or attached, you must prove that your septic system is working and that it can accommodate this additional dwelling unit. So it's a, pos a serious possibility that by virtue of applying for an accessory dwelling unit, you'd have to test your system and therefore reduce the amount of uh, potential pollution to the, the lakes and rivers that we value so highly. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Peter. All right, anyone else? I, John, let's not debate the zoning <laughs> articles tonight. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, we we need to do the business of of the, that we're talking about for next week. Um, with regard to old business, Bill, do you have something you want to? Yes, I'd like about? to just take a couple of minutes. Uh, apropos of Michael's comment about educated electorate, um, <clears throat> at a recent selectmen's meeting, in response to a statement made by a resident, I commented that the water, the town, and the water commissioners have different agendas, and that at a future time we should make an effort to understand the differences while acknowledging that there's not a water crisis in New London today. But in three subsequent settings over the past week, individuals have continued to make remarks that suggest that I need to make a short clarification of my original comment and will not wait for another, another time to uh, uh, educate the public a bit. First of all, I've attended virtually every meeting of the water commissioners over the last year. And in my opinion, the water department is well run the commissioners are attentive to the needs of the precinct and are clear in their priorities, which currently focus on replacing the 50-year-old mains on Main Street in New London. At the Selectman's invitation, the commissioners also 
the commissioners were invited to speak at a board meeting uh, a few months ago and provide a comprehensive history of the evolution of the precinct, particularly since the development of the Colby Point Wells in 1995. And I think that presentation was well accepted accepted by everybody who was present. The commissioners have repeatedly stated that there's not a water capacity problem with service to the existing customer base or an additional small number of new connections in line with historical trends. So not a crisis, not a problem. The decision in 2023, last year, not to provide domestic water service to the Twin Pines development was prompted by a ruling from the Department of Environmental Services of the state of New Hampshire, the state's water regulatory authority, that the New London Springfield Water Precinct does not have the capacity for a project the size of Longmeadow Commons, the name of the Twin Pines development, and a subsequent acknowledgement that service also could not be provided to New London Place for the same reason. Both developers are now seeking on-site well water for their respective projects, and it appears that water will be available from these alternative sources. In fact, one of the developers contacted me today to tell me that the water for that one for his project is going quite well. All of which is background to my statement that we have different agendas. This is important. The, the precinct's agenda is to serve its current customer base plus a very small incremental number of new customers. Neither the precinct nor DES expects to serve a larger population. Until recently, there's been no evidence that this stance was in question. What, is it what has triggered the precinct's concerns with New London are the number of recent zoning changes approved and in process that have unexpectedly increased the possibility of development in the precinct that was previously not possible under the existing zoning ordinances. I will not belabor tonight about what those changes have been, but there have been changes in the New London zoning ordinances over the last few years that have increased the possibility of more development in town. In contrast, the town's agenda has been to provide some zoning flexibility in order to promote the development of more affordable housing, workforce house type housing, or retirement type housing. To the extent that zoning changes have promoted development in the precinct, there may exist a conflict of agendas between the town that would like to have more housing and between the water precinct that is not prepared to provide a water supply beyond its existing customer base. In all of this, the good news is that Twin Pines and Continuum are demonstrating that domestic water supplies from the precinct are not necessary to accomplish the development permitted by the zoning changes. Concurrently, the precinct continues to undertake long-term engineering work to identify possible additional sources for possible supplements to meeting the needs of the current customer base and continues to promote usage habits that help conserve water, including limiting irrigation where necessary. So the bottom line is very simple. We have different agendas. The agenda of whether or not uh, the town should be provide, providing more house, water for more housing, but water is extremely important, but the availability to current customers in the precinct is not a crisis, and both Twin Pines and Continuum have demonstrated that there is water possible to do, develop within the existing zoning. So I hope that clarifies my comment about having conflicting agendas. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Okay, um, moving on. Um, Bibi, do you have any comments you want to make about anything at this point? No. No. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Shall we go through the warrant and decide who's going to take which um, articles? Are you ready for that? Kim, you're all set. Okay. Um, Why don't you read off what you think we're going to do, and then we can okay. disagree with you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Article <laughs> three is a petition warrant article for nine hundred thousand dollars. I can take that one. Um, BB, Article 4, would you be interested in um, taking that one? Yes. Okay. Uh, Bill, how about number five for you? Yes. I'll take number six. BB, do you want to take number seven? Sure. Bill, how about eight for you? Sure. Okay. Now, if you don't want to take something, BB, you know, let us know. Oh. Um, <laughs> I'll take I'll take number nine. And Bill, okay. will you do 10? I'll do 10. BB 11. Okay. And Bill, you're going to take 12. Is that right? Uh, yep, I'll do 12. I'll do 13. 
Um, BB, how about 14 for you? Stuart? Bill, 15? Yes. I've got 16. Um, Article 17, BB? Okay. Bill, can you take 18? Uh, 18, uh, yes. I will do Article 19. Uh, Bill, do you want to do Article 20? Sure. BB, um, 21 for you? Sure. I'll take 22. And Bill, do you want to take Article 23? Sure. And that's all the articles. All right. Okay. Yep. Um, and Kim will be updating that document that she sent earlier with all those changes. Right. Yeah. She'll she'll <laughs> send you so I can list. practice. And then I had, right. I had one comment that I was going to make when I when I had my name assigned to Article 22, and I was just going to ask to have available um, the balances on those four funds in case the question came up. Oh, um, so now I, Bill's going to cover I'm, it. Yeah, I'm going to take. Yeah, I'm going to take it. Yeah, we'll definitely have those balances. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Are we good on that? Okay. Yeah. Kim, Kim, do you have an um, administrator report? The only thing we're working on is town meeting. Um, mm -hmm. Will's working on town meeting and elections, so we've been busy in the office. Everybody's uh, full speed ahead. We're looking forward to it, hoping the weather's nice. Um, and we'll be all set. That's all I have. Okay. Um, Bill, do you have any anything to report? No. BBU, have you been to any? Um, yeah, I'll make this really quick. Uh, uh, I was on the call on um, Tuesday, again, for the Coalition Communities 2.0. They were giving an update on the RAND case. They were filing a motion to the Supreme Court that afternoon um, for, to... Number one, it was a motion to appeal, and a number two, a motion for an emergency stay, an emergency because they're hoping that the court will give a decision on the stay before towns have their town meetings. Um, so I haven't heard an update after Tuesday, but that was their plan, was to file those two motions on Tuesday afternoon. Okay, That's all I, I had got. a meeting. All right. Um, I had a meeting today of the Lakes Advisory Committee for the state, and um, the topics were um, some of the pending legislation with regard to wakeboarding, um, also uh, issues about um, pollution to the lakes, and um, there are laws pending on all of those things, and the bills that were um, promoted by the House are now being uh, turned over to the Senate. So they, there weren't any um, final votes on any of these, but it was a very interesting meeting. Um, okay, Kim? Yep, go ahead. I should have mentioned municipal matters went out today, and there are very interesting candidate bios. Um, thanks to Will for coming up with that idea. I think it's um, a great way for people who weren't able to make the very successful candidates night. Um, they can read a little bit about the candidate. So please pick up your copy or read it online and it's free. Okay. Um, do I have a motion to accept, approve uh, the minutes of February 22nd and February 27th? Have you had a chance to see them, uh, BB? I have. Yep. I read them this afternoon. So, so moved. Okay. Second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Can you, each, can you each say, yeah, you have to say. Yes, Aye. yes. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, so just to remind everyone that um, Tuesday from 7 to 7 is um, ballot elections. And then Wednesday from 7, 7 p.m. till um, not 3 a.m. Uh, we'll have the uh, actual budget, uh, the, the hearing on the budget. So we hope we get lots of turnout for that. Anybody have anything else they want to say? No? I am going to work on trying to get this space for the March 21st meeting so that BB can participate this way. So oh, okay. if so, we'll change that location. Okay. Thank you. Actually, on the calendar, uh, Janet, we might just point out for people that listen to this, that the Springfield, uh, New London Springfield Water Precinct has its annual meeting the following week on the 19th okay. at Whipple Hall. And it's important this particular year because there is a uh, $4.8 million bond being proposed. And so people should know that it's there and that they're going to be voting to approve that bonding. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Bill. Thank um, you. So we have some things to sign and BB, I guess you can say goodbye. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>